Oh, let me see. Get adjusted here. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to mess up my long hair due to wear my hat. I'm Joyce and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, these are my 12 roses from my sponsor and these, this hat will be good until I'm in the meeting, big meeting in the sky. So there we go. Um, thank you, Gordon, for letting me have this opportunity to share. It's not uncommon at birthday time if you want to be able to share your sobriety with other AAs that Gordon won't put you on the board. So. Right. I can't remember if he asked me or I asked him, but if he hadn't asked me, I would have asked him, so it doesn't really matter. Um, I've had a, an interesting week. Uh, it's been birthday week uh, as, as of uh, Tuesday. But I really started a week ago tonight uh, with Cornerstone birthday because the birthdays end at the end of the month and they're just every group that I go to is having a birthday by the time that week is up, I need about a month of vacation. <laughs> so uh, one more time I'm going to share, I, at least today I have time to share a little of what I was like and what happened. In 10 minutes or five minutes when you're in the birthday meetings, you kind of got to make a point and sit down before the bell goes off. and. Uh, and that can be frustrating, it can also be relieving because you don't have to say much. But I love celebration and anybody that knows me knows that. I believe that celebration is a spiritual discipline. Um, in my bigger book that I read, there was lots of celebration. And, um, and I incorporate that in my soul and in my heart and in what keeps my motor running. Uh, and I celebrate without apology because it can, you know, it can get misconstrued as all kinds of things, show off and ego and whatever. And I just decline that and go, no, I'm going to celebrate sobriety. I not only celebrate my sobriety, I celebrate your sobriety. And some of you, I don't even know how long that is or where it is or how it is or where you are in it. But that's the one thing, one of the two things that I have in common with you. One thing I have in common with you is a disease that wants to kill us, and the other is a solution that wants to save us. And I think that's worth celebrating. Um, so what I was like, I'm going to touch some high points. Facts are, I was born December 31st, 1941, in Hamilton County, Kansas, in a little tiny town on the, on the edge of I'm, I was just miles away from three states, not very far to the Oklahoma border, not very far to the Colorado border, and down in the corner of Kansas. And I used that along my way because when I needed doctors to prescribe medications for me, I would cross state lines and, and have doctors all over the place. We didn't have social media and the internet and entrapment in those days. I even wrote my own prescriptions. Um, I stole a prescription pad from my doctor, and when that used up, I didn't have any more, so I had to quit using that one. Um, I never did really like living in a small town. I was the oldest, uh, I still am, <laughs> um, of eight kids except for a sister who committed suicide. So I went all 12 years of school, uh, living out on the turkey farm, ashamed of where I lived. I didn't like having four little Kansas girls before I turned four. Um, I didn't know how we kept having babies, but one day my sister came to me and said, is mama going to have another baby? And I said, well, I don't know. Why do you think she'd be having another baby? And she said, well, because mama and daddy had a fight again, and every time they have a fight, we have a baby. <laughs> and I was like, well, okay. That says a whole bunch of what I was like. Because I looked at that and I thought, that's true. They would kiss and make up and we'd have another baby. And then they would fight and kiss and make up and we'd have another baby. We didn't, I didn't. I didn't have another baby, but they did. And I must have, in my youngness, felt crowded out. I felt crowded out of my space. I mean, we lived in about, I've drawn that house out on graph paper. And it's not over 600 square feet. And at one point, eight of us lived in there. There were no closets, no bathrooms, no doors. There was a room here, it wa and you walked through an open doorway, and there was a, a room there. 
So I struggled on the farm, and my dad is an alcoholic, so I was brought up in the disease of alcoholism. I found my comfort and solace in several things, but mostly in books and in trying to be a good student. Uh, and I was a good student up until the disease of alcoholism ripped away any shred of me having a very successful life of any sort from my father's alcoholism, in which immediately led right into mine. His alcoholism screwed up my life for the first however many years, and then right, I just took up where he left off. Um, I knew nothing about what an alcoholic was. I didn't know anything about the nature of alcoholism. We didn't even talk in those terms. People who drank too much were drunks and bums in my vocabulary and in the vocabulary around me, in the people in the... I think we have had between 1,700 and 1,900 people live in Syracuse, Kansas for 77 years. If somebody dies, somebody else is born. If a dog dies, a puppy is born. And that you could have been there 77 years ago or you could be there now and you'd be in the same town. Except they put a stoplight in somewhere between the time I was born and now. But they haven't ever added a second one. So uh, that's the state of the... And I'm, I'm really realized I'm not a city girl, but I'm a big town girl. I like to have a, a mall, and I like to have a movie theater, and there's a few things that I like to have, and Reno's just about to outgrow my desire for any more stuff around here. Um, so I used books, and I used school until I met my first husband, who had a letter jacket, and he drove a car. And that was enough for me. He, uh, he was six years older than I was, and he was in his first year of college, and I must have been close to my first year of high school. And that impressed me. And I used to say when I told my story that all you had to do to have a relationship with me is to want to. If you liked me, I liked you. And if you didn't want to and you had a car, I would have probably made you want to. So say no more about the back seat of the car. Um, and so uh, I hooked up with him, and we were a perfect victim and villain couple. He needed a victim, and I needed a villain, and we did that for 10 years. And in the process, we got married. I left the ranch, as my dad used to call it. It was a shit-ass turkey farm, guys. There was no ranch. <laughs> was, I know I lived there. I had turkey shit between my toes. So let's don't make this any more glamorous than it was. It's, I, I say that so that you know I didn't leave much. <laughs> I didn't leave the farm and, and the wonderful ranch story. And we got married, and nine months and, nine months and two days later, I had my daughter. I tell you, I think I kept that kid entrapped long enough that the gossipy old ladies that were wondering, oh, did she have to get married, it was real evident I did not. I made it by two days. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> that didn't make me a virgin, though, let me tell you. Um, it was just, that was a big deal in those days. Mama, all the women went in and marked their calendars the day that a, a high school girl got married to see who had to get married. I want to say get a life. Um, and so we had two kids. One of them is here today, my son, my granddaughter. Thank you guys for showing up. Um, and I was already well on my way with this disease, although I had not picked up a drink of alcohol that you buy in a liquor store. I had had substances from the time, I found out later from the time I was a baby. Uh, when my dad put whiskey in my baby bottle. And there's just lots and lots of stories that could be told about those next years, except that my story's my story, and, in, and there's a benefit to telling my story, but it's not what qualifies me to be here. And that, to me, I will always say that from now on, because I think that is so critical. If it's critical for me, I can assume that maybe there's one other person in the room that it will be critical to to know that the qualifications to be here, the requirement to be here, is a, is a desire to stop drinking. So if I had, I said this yesterday, if I had gone out 
got drunk on Saturday night and came back in and said, I never want to do that again in my life, I could come to AA with a desire to stop drinking. Now, I don't know anybody that's done that. An alcoholic would not stop drinking because one night was bad. So we're all going to have a story. The lash of alcoholism and, and um, what beat me in, into AA was my story. But it's not why I'm qualified to be here. And that's, I just need to keep that straight for myself. Um, and certainly I did not understand the nature of this disease whatsoever. I thought that drunkenness was a moral issue, definitely a religious issue, and also a self-respect issue. And it was an issue, if you love me enough, you'd quit drinking, and all of that, that, that all of us in one way or another have probably been through. And what a relief. I have 50 years of compounding that truth, and it's very strong in me now that the nature of my disease is a disease, just like cancer is a disease, just like diabetes is a disease. It's a disease, and it's not treatable with chemotherapy or radiation or low whatever, eat less sugar, that type of treatment, but I have a treatment and a recovery program for my disease, and I need to take my medicine every day. And that is critical for me to remember that because I can still start to dog myself and, and bad talk myself if I don't keep myself spiritually fit. One of the things I love about the big book is how simple, well, I like it and it frustrates me. So this is bipolarism going on here. I love the book and sometimes it's just too damn simple. And that troubles me. I go, pause, that's spiritual? I mean, okay, pause, and then what? Hell no, when I'm up to my eyeballs in alligators, the last thing I want to do is pause. I want to get the hell out of there. And the quicker, the better. But that's, and I'm not literally in a swamp with alligators, or I probably would get out immediately. I doubt if I'd hit my knees and pray when an alligator's have after my tail, but it, it is the thing that I, and my life lately has been full of this. I've had to pull my toolbox out and, and use it, and I just want to share with you one of the ways, this, this is my quiet time this morning, because my life is in a state of real turmoil right now. Not mine, but mine related to things in my life. And I found myself this morning waking up full of fear. And I recognized fear right away. And the first thing I started to do was cry. And I thought, this whole thing, I mean, I have a family of about 13 people and two of them and my daughter are in my life right now. And it's sad. I hadn't resorted to fear up until now, but I, so I thought, what do I do here? And my head was going, you know, I'm going to hire a lawyer, I'm going to do da 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 I go, wait a minute, pause. Why don't I get my big book out and see what it says about fear? And this is what it says about fear. That I review it thoroughly, which I sat there and tried to do, put it on paper so I wrote it down, and then here's what I read in the book. We ask him to remove our fear and ask him to direct our attention to what he would have us be. At once, we commence to outgrow fear. So that's what it tells me to do. Just to the extent that we do as we think he would have us and humbly rely on him, <clears throat> does he enable us to match calamity with serenity? And right now, I have serenity. I did this this morning. I took my tool out of the toolbox and I used it. And then I sat there for a while and I thought, well, it says that we humbly ask him. So I looked at my 12 and 12 to look up the definition of humble and humility and found out that it is, I mean, I know this, but I reminded myself again that the definition of humility is a desire to seek and do God's will. So I got quiet and I said, God, I humbly ask you, 
I have a sincere desire that you get between me and this fear before this fear gets between me and you. And that's how I use my toolbox. And right now, I'm fine. Now, nothing changed. The shit that's flying around is still flying. But I'm not under it. I'm not going down with it. It forced me into my toolbox. And it's not easy. This morning, it's simple, but it's not easy. This morning wasn't easy for me to not go into a little bit of playing with the disease. Like, well, don't I get to at least be just pissed off here just for a minute and call up some people? Now, I will talk about this, and I will get with the people that I feel safe with, that I trust, and I won't just shove this under a rug. So there will be a process to be done. <clears throat> but this is what the program has taught me. I don't have to live only not drinking. I don't want to live dry drunk. And I've had several extended dry drunks in my sobriety. And I'm grateful I didn't drink over them, but I just don't want to live in them. And I don't have to. I have a toolbox and, a, and the elements of living a life that, and, and the, the elements that solve all my problems. That's just an example of how that solved my anger and fear problem without the problem ever moving. It's right where it always was. It didn't change, I do. In my story, I don't tell what it was like, what it is like now, and, and what it's like now, what happened. I say, I talk about how I was, not how it was, and how I am now, because I have found it doesn't change much. It is full of lumps and bumps and sadness and ups and downs and chaos and turmoil and arguments and resentments and fights and probably always will be as long as I live on this planet and for sure this world as long as I live in my family and that's something I can't divorce so 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 be it. Fast forward, uh, well I spent five years which I'm not going to talk much about because um, I've been up real close and personal with it and I, I told Karen before the meeting that I feel real raw and exposed in a good way. Now that's a new feeling for me because raw and exposed are not good feelings usually. But I know that there is an element of safety in vulnerability and in full disclosure. In a, Yes, in a general way, I, I believe that. But if I'm having a bad time in my sobriety, I don't care if I'm sober 50 years, I don't care if I'm sober 70 years, I don't care if I'm sober 90 days, I need to share that stuff. And um, so I do, I share the good and I share the bad and I've pretty much been that way all of the time that I've been in the program because as I do it, I find it beneficial. Someone will come up to me maybe months later and say, the fr I remember the first time I ever met you and you were talking about your falling apart family and you had 50 years sobriety and I thought, oh my God, if she can do that at 50, I can certainly do it at 10. And that's the way that has worked for me. And sometimes I may be overexposed and underdeveloped, but I just live with that too. Uh, and that's just me. So... Um, the five years I spent in the mental institutions were excruciating. There were no civil rights. I lost my kids. I lost my right to vote. I couldn't drive a car. And there was nothing anybody could do about it. And very little of us know what the civil rights do, did for other than for uh, the black people that we know that part. And good for that. But it also did a huge uh, uproar for mental institutions. And I was an inmate or patient or resident or whatever you want to call it one day and the next day and, and had been for five. I was a lifer. If you got institutionalized back in the 60s in a, in a mental institution, for the third time they could keep you forever. And most people don't know that. And what set us free to a lot of calamity was the civil rights movement. And they just threw us out. They called me into the office of that mental institution one day 
And I walked in and there was like an eight foot table and three people that looked pretty official were sitting across from me. And they said, the, the one of them spoke up and said, we're here to tell you that you are no longer a, a resident of this institution. And I saw a nurse over here and a nurse over here. And they came over and each one of them had a, a, a needle. They shot me and that's the last thing I remember until I came to in a cemetery in Garden City, Kansas, several hundred miles away. Wow. And I owned a house and I was sleeping in a cemetery. <laughs> and um, I got carried to my first meeting about 10 days after that by my dad. And he laid me up on the table and that was my first meeting. Mm -hmm. And I came to on that table. Um, I'm glad my dad only had a fourth grade education because I think anybody with four, four grades in one day would have thought that was stupid. Why would you pick up a 230 pound dirty, peed on, sick, cemetery resident and bring her to a meeting and lay her on a table for God's sake? And my, did, my dad didn't see anything wrong with that. He just said, she's drunk, that's where drunks go is AA, so there I was. Um, I have never fought the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm not one of those who, who wasn't willing. I'm not one of those who wanted to argue with the book. I didn't have the capacity to grasp and develop what it took to stay sober here. So suffice it to say, although that was December 19th, 1966, you can look at my hat and tell that there's some time went by there before I got this. And it was being incapable of grasping and developing what it took to stay here. And to anybody that's having trouble with this program, I say, that's why you keep coming back. Keep coming back increased my capacity. And I will believe that until I die. Every time I came back through those doors again, I was building capacity to grasp and develop. Concepts. The concept of call somebody, the concept of, of find somebody that you hope you can trust and tell them about whatever's going on. Well, I didn't find that woman. The men in, I was the only woman in my first five groups. I was the only young person. I was the only duly addicted person. I changed my name to George, but it didn't make me male. Uh, so I was, I was the only female, um, and the al hated me, and I hated them. So I padded my bras and cut my skirts off six inches and got some go-go boots and just got it on. Not that kind of on. I didn't do that yet. Yet. Uh, that came to pass, but I hadn't done that yet. Um, and that was my retaliation at the al -Anons. And I've made amends to Al-Anon since then. Um, and, and so began my journey. Um, the guys got together and said, we've got to find a woman somewhere that can handle this woman because we don't know what to do with her. I was a self-mutilator, so I cut myself up with razor blades. I put a six pack of beer under my chair occasionally in the meeting. I swore I wouldn't drink it till I got out, but you could be for sure that I was gonna drink it just in case I needed it, I wanted it there. Nobody ever took my six pack away from me. Um, and I was a force to be reckoned with. Somebody challenged me one night that I wasn't an alcoholic and it doesn't take much to just stand up and take that table and just flip the hell out of it. Coffee cups flew everywhere. People ran everywhere, and I said, uh, and I knew the third tradition before I knew the first step. I said, I'm an alcoholic if I say so, and I say so. So set the table back up, and let's move on. Um, and that was the way I behaved in my first group. So I see why they got together to see if they could find a woman who might take me on. <laughs> And so I got the longest sober woman in the state of Kansas at that time. Her name was Olga. And in 1966, she had 15 years sobriety. Mm -hmm. She's in the big picture of the convention when AA comes of age. Mm -hmm. 
and she takes her little fingernail and points in that in a spot about the size of the head of a match and said, I was sitting right about here. <laughs> and she was so proud of that. So you know I got bona fide, big book, early history, AA, shoved at me. Uh, and she lived, I looked it up the other day on the map. I thought she lived about 200 miles away. But I think when I looked it up, I didn't Google it. I still use an atlas. Um, it was about 165 miles. I didn't have a phone. I didn't have a car. I had a pen, and I had paper, and I had my book. And I wrote back and forth to her my steps. Um, I could use a pay phone to call her. And if I did what I was supposed to be doing every quarter, she would come and get me and take me back up to stay with her for a weekend. And that was like a, hanging a carrot in front of my face. I worked the first few steps to get to go to her house, Aww. way more than I did to recover. That's how much I wanted somebody who loved me. And she genuinely did. She drove me up to the Denver young people about the self-mutilation because she just said, you scare the hell out of me. I, I have no idea what to do. But she did do one thing that did psychologically didn't work, but I think she thought it would. She said, I have a good idea, Joyce. You come up and I'll lay my arm on the table and you take the razor blade and cut it up and then you can do yours. And I was like, it didn't stop me. It was like being scared straight. It, that didn't work, but it made an impact on me. I saw a glimmer of what that part of my disease was doing to other people. Because for a minute, I just felt you couldn't put a gun to my head and make me harm her. You couldn't. I wouldn't do it. But I would willingly do it to myself. <clears throat> and I, today, I don't self-mutilate. I had other isms, too, that she said to me, you are going to have to stop drinking over your defects of character. You're not on step eight and nine yet. So if you go steal, don't drink. If you go shoplifting, don't drink. If you sleep with somebody else's husband, which I had never thought about doing, but then I did, <laughs> don't drink. And I got that. She said, Joyce, short form, if you can't stop doing the wrong things, don't stop doing the right things, because right will always prevail. So I didn't refuse to be secretary of a group because I was still shoplifting. I couldn't stop, do I didn't stop doing any of the wrong things. The only thing I stopped doing was drinking, August 27th, 1969. The other isms were full blown, still raging, still going, and I was delegate and still shoplifting. And I was 20 years sober. Now, I'm 25 years clean of shoplifting, so I'm glad I have 50 years here so I can tell you I finally got through my defects because some of them were still going strong at 20 years sobriety. I don't urge anybody else to do that, but God removes my defects. I don't. The psychiatrist didn't. The medication didn't. Uh, banging my head on the altar didn't. Getting baptized again didn't. And I did all the above. I, had, I was in an exorcism. That didn't stop it either. That got removed when it got removed. And that was while I was off being of service to Alcoholics Anonymous. It's while <clears throat> where I was out. Oh, and I finally, in the process of being in those mental institutions, I lost my kids. And the judge that, that I don't know how a judge was involved because it didn't take a judge to put me in the state hospital. That's all very confusing to me still without civil rights. Maybe it was because by the time I got out, that was civil rights and then things had to be handled in the court. But he promised me that as long as he lived and breathed, I would never see my kids again. Well, I proved him frickin' wrong. <laughs> One of my kids is sitting here today. I have, and, I, and I've, I've got a rest of my story is I had another baby after I had those two kids with, with Fred, my second husband. And I have grandkids and I have great grandkids. So there you go, Judge Green, I showed you. Um, <laughs> But you know, I could see him as a judge saying, this woman is not capable of being a mother. And I believe that he had my kid's best interest at heart, but I didn't think that then. Um, so I got my kids back um, and I, I just continued to do the right thing. That's what I tell people today. 
I know that's something that you want to have removed, but why don't you just do the next right thing? If the group asks you to be secretary, be secretary. They don't ask you to tell them your fifth step. They just said, do you want a secretary of this group? And if you're not drinking, you're qualified to be secretary or whatever other service, greet at the door, pour coffee, clean up afterwards, put the chairs away, go to the central office and get literature. Those are right things. And right has prevailed in my life. And she wasn't even, well, I'm sure she was spiritual, but she didn't come off religious. It was just like, like everybody ought to know that. If you do the right thing, it will finally prevail. And that, that for me has been true. Um, so it was very interesting working steps uh, without a phone and without a car. And, and so today, and my, I mean, we couldn't have sat down and read the book together if we'd had to. We didn't get to see each other that much. Um, and my book tells me, give the book to my prospect and take it home, tell him to take it home and read it. And then ask, are you willing to go to these lengths? I personally feel that going to any lengths gets a little bit perverted sometimes when it gets thrown out there. Are you willing to go to any length to do anything on the planet? No, I'm not. No. But I am willing to go to any lengths to get what's between the covers of that big book and the 12 Steps and 12 Traditions. The first time Olga took me through the steps, I believe, now my daughter says that I don't, I don't know what I'm talking about, and she's possibly right. She had a better brain at that time than I did. And she said she never remembers Olga sponsoring me without both books. But I now take my sponsees through the 12 and 12. And I'll tell you in step six and seven, uh, with which we have about this much in the big book, um, I see why Bill needed to write some more about step six and seven. And in there it says we write the question and we write the answer. I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory about what you're supposed to do. And I'm amazed at the number of people that have never done that. So if you haven't done it, challenge your sponsor um, and go through the 12 and 12. Um, I love Alcoholics Anonymous. In, when I was in that first group, a speaker meeting, that's when uh, recorded speakers were on reel to reel. Some of you don't even know what reel to reel is, it, but it's real. I mean, it was this big box and it had wheels on it, and there was this long movie tape like, and it ran, and you could hear the speaker speak. And so that was a speaker meeting because the speaker was on the tape. And Chuck Chamberlain, who wrote the book uh, New Pair of Glasses, and some of you maybe don't know about him either, but he was speaking that night and he was talking. He was. Uh, They'd only had delegates three years when Chuck Chamberlain was delegate. And he was talking about this awesome experience of being delegate. He was in New York, and they stayed up all night working on things for AA. Now, I wasn't even sober. I think I was sober at that meeting, but I wasn't sober. And I went, oh my God, that's what I want to do. I want to be delegate. Now, I didn't want to work the steps. I mean, I, I, I wasn't even staying sober. I had no idea what a delegate was. I just knew that this man was excited and I was excited about what he was excited about. And 20 years later, my name came out of the hat in Tonopah as delegate. So you can, hang a, you can hang a vision for you out there. I did. That was my vision for me, is I'm gonna grow up and I'm gonna be delegate. Um, and I loved the trip along the way too. I, I, my sponsor got me into service right away. But you know, we had to untangle the meaning of some things for me. I thought, def I didn't know defects of character were natural instincts run riot. I thought I was a defect of character. I was the defect of character, created defectively. And in, I wasn't created defectively, but I got made defectively by the, by the uh, disease of alcoholism that you, you develop and grow up in. Uh, but that had to be set straight for me. Um, my natural instincts are part of me, and there's nothing wrong with them. But when they run riot, or I demand more than is possible or do me, or they drive me blindly, and I think any of us that are in touch with ourselves, or I'll speak for myself, I know when I'm being driven blindly. I'm flipping people off with my middle finger, or I'm with my granddaughter while she gives the uh, public a talking to about the way they drive. 
Uh, and, and I said, oh my God, I'm glad I just have parking lot rage. I don't have road rage. <clears throat> I think she says she doesn't have road rage. She, she has road annoyance. And I think that's a lesser degree of the disease of road rage. So uh, we don't talk about that much. I just sit in the car and go, thank you, Jesus, we're safe. Uh, <laughs> and then I'm not a naggy grandma. I'm her best friend, and that's nice. But I, I've responded well to having a vision for myself as well as just doing what's in front of me. And today I am able to look at the defects. Also, an other misunderstanding I had about in the defects of character, I did my inventory, I saw the people that I resented, and I got my list, and I looked at my part, and I did all of that, um, was I don't dig for my part if there isn't a my part. Every single thing that happens to me, I don't have a part in. The only part I have is how I react to it. Other times, I'm a very big part of it. I'm the instigator of it. And I, and I need to look at that and get that down. Um, I didn't know what humility was. I thought humility was that I couldn't raise my voice, I couldn't be popular, I couldn't walk in a room and have a dozen people say hello because that's egotistical until I read that definition of humility that I just read today and that made it so simple for me. If I have a desire to seek and do God's will, and that's the 12, 12 and 12 definition of humility, then I'm humble. And there's no ego in, I mean, if I eat chocolate cake, I'm full. You know, it is, if that's the, if that's the definition and I do that, then I am that. And I don't let that other stuff pollute in my brain and get me confused. Um, I met at my, uh, see, I came into AA in 1966, uh, was off to Cedar Glen Canyon, which is down in Lubbock, Texas, to a conference, and I came back, and lo and behold, here was another young people, and it was a he, and his name was Fred, and I didn't, we didn't have a lot of preaching and teaching about you don't get you know, involved in the first year. If I didn't get involved in the first year, I wouldn't be sober because I'm involved with all of you. So we know what involved meant. You know, it didn't mean involved. It meant don't get involved. Uh, and, uh, depending on how you put that without really saying don't, get, don't go get laid. Let's just lay it out there. Uh, and so I thought, well, I wonder how I could get to know him without knowing him. And I went, I know, start a group. And there's, and so it better be young people's because we're the only two young people. So I, I, I think it was Fred's fifth week of AA and I caught him at the meeting and I said, Fred, I need to talk to you. We're gonna start a young, now he didn't know young people from Shinola. I said, we're gonna start a young people's group. You're the secretary, I'm the GSR. So I put myself in general service by myself. <laughs> and that group is still going today. And so I got to see him every Friday night. Uh, we would make 35 cups of coffee for two of us. <laughs> we would open up the big book. I got to hold hands when we said the serenity prayer, and I loved that. That was fun. Uh, and then we read to each other out of the big book, and then we said the Lord's Prayer and dumped out 33 cups of coffee and <laughs> went home. And we did that for nine months. And one night, Fred asked me if I would like to go to dinner. Now, he would take me for Cokes and we'd go eat, but it sounded like he was asking differently. Not like, do you want to go to coffee after the meeting? No, it was like, Joyce, would you be interested in going to dinner with me? Doesn't that sound different to you? <laughs> And I said, well, yeah, I guess so. So we went to dinner, we went to a meeting, we went home and he walked me to the door. And I thought, do I hold hands and say the Lord's Prayer? Or is he gonna kiss me? Neither one happened. He just said goodnight. But that was what was going through my head. And that was the beginning of my dating Fred. 
And I, I proposed to him every year for three years in a row. And I would say, Fred, do you think you're ever going to marry me? And he said, no, I'm never marrying anybody. So I would cry and have a fit and get all upset and go back. And a year later, I would ask him again. Finally, on the third year, his third birthday, we got married. And I was married to him uh, for five years. And then I divorced him. And I thought, well, you son of a bitch. I had to propose to you for three years straight before you wanted me. Who says I want you? And so I got a divorce. And I think that was retaliation for him not wanting to marry me the minute he saw me. Um, and what a, what a life. I mean, it was, it was good, good years. We were together close to 50 years. He died of Alzheimer's 15, 16 months ago. No, I think I added it up and it was 18 months ago. What I want to say in my last few minutes is I have probably, I think I can honestly say that I have never needed my toolbox and the understanding of what tool goes where like I have needed it the last three years. With Fred dying, uh, with me going through what I've been going through with family, um, turning 50, uh, I'm a cancer survivor and I had a pain in my chest the other day that I, in, with breast cancer and the very first thing I thought of is, is my cancer back and that fear only lasted me about an hour before I got on top of it and said, well, if I really am still concerned, I'll go to the doctor. But I did a similar thing to what I did this morning, and it works. I did commence at once to whatever it says. What does it say? Um, we commence at once to outgrow fear. And, and I, I don't know. I mean, the pain's not there now, so I'm not making an appointment with my doctor. But I'm just saying that this program has met my needs, the needs of my life, in whatever instance and decade where it says, uh, there is one who has all power. I used to read that. There is one who has all power. May you find him now. I read it now. There is one who has all power. May you find him right now. Right now. When I need it, may you find him. And I can tell you this, I have found him. I continue, I would continue to come back to AA even if I didn't know that I need it. But the reason, one of the main reasons that I keep coming back is because I like the sense of ease and comfort that I experience being in AA. And I like the effect that it produces in me. I like the effect it produces in you. Uh, because we are uh, people who would not normally mix. And I love the way we mix. Thanks.